How's it going, everybody? Welcome to Tombstone's Takes. I'm Tombstone, and I'm here to talk about the good, the bad, the ugly, and interesting about books, books, books. Today, because we're nearing on spooky season, I'm going to bring you a list of books that bring the bite back to vampires. I know what a lot of you are thinking. I know a lot of you are thinking since vampires blew up with on the paranormal romance scene with books like Twilight or The Vampire Diaries, vampires might have felt defanged a little bit and it might have gotten too oversaturated. Now, granted, there have been a lot of vampire books, even ones where the vampires stick to the blood, the guts, and the horror. I might talk about a few of those today, but I'm also going to give you ones that are going to try and bring those vampires back. Those ones that shed the sparkling, that shed that trope of human vampire romance and bring back the fangs, the blood, the guts, and the violence and the gore. So stay tuned. Now down through the years, like I said, vampires have traditionally been scary creatures in the night. There have been all kinds of superstitions, lore about vampires, all the way from vampires can only be killed through stakes through their heart. Some of them can transform into wolves or bats. Some of them can fly. There's all kinds of superstitions surrounding vampires. And throughout the years, there have been numbers of books to explore this. All the way back to Carmilla by J. Sheridan Le Fanu, to Dracula, who may be potentially the world's most famous vampire, Bram Stoker. And as you get into the, the modern era, we see books that have stayed on shelves and have become classics. You see books like I Am Legend by Richard Matheson, who where the story becomes about the last man alive in a world of vampires. Or you see Salem's Lot, where the town is infiltrated by vampires. Of course, Stephen King wrote that one. You see the Vampire Chronicles with Les Stott and Anne Rice. You also have the 80s and the 90s, where other horror writers and some of the, the big names they took their turn driving the wheel with the proverbial vampire. You've got Robert McCammon, They Thirst. Dan Simmons, who used mind vampires. And if you've watched my other videos, you know I thought that mind vampires is kind of a, kind of a dumb term. But man, that book, Carry On Comfort from Dan Simmons, oh, it's so fantastic. And I had to get past this idea that the term mind vampires was dumb. And once I did, I found myself engrossed in a great novel. Some other hard hitting vampire novels from the eighties and the nineties include the light at the end by John Skip and Craig Spector, Anno Dracula by Kim Newman. And then you get into the two thousands where you have um, I, and you might have seen a copy of this on my book haul. I bought The Historian. I, I, I had that one. And then uh, you, I've also, you also see in the 2000s uh, where some movies have come into play from horror writers. Let Me In, that novel by John Lindquist that, that came from Across the Pond. The Passage by Justin Cronin, those things are right there coming out around the same time that Twilight was hitting the boom and the, the Vampire Diaries were, were really taking off. But those books, they still kept the horror and the fangs and the blood. At the same time, you had other kinds of vampires like Fledgling by Octavia E. Butler, which I just read. I personally didn't enjoy that one all that much. There were some things I couldn't get past about the book. The, the, the concept of a vampire waking up and not knowing where she was seemed interesting to me at first. It turned into a vampire courtroom drama about figuring out which vampires were bigots. That wasn't what I couldn't get past. I couldn't get past some of the sexuality in the book. Um, there are some things that ended up being a little bit more like pedophilia or... Poly and poly 
polyamory to me. And those things, I just, I, I couldn't get past those things. Um, and I didn't enjoy that one. Although I truly, typically have enjoyed Octavia Butler's stuff in the past. But if you want to get just to my list today, let me tell you the rules for the books that I'm going to suggest. First, the books have to have come out post 2010, which means that, that those books have come out after the, the big saturation of media with vampires, paranormal romance, vampire diaries. The vampires, they have to be violent vampires. They have to be about doing harm or actually drinking blood to humans. Three, the book itself has to shun this vampire human romance trope. That's got to be gone. It's got to be done. If it happens in a book, it has to happen for a reason. Typically, maybe, potentially, for the aim of the vampire to get what they want. Four, another thing that it has to shun is it has to shun the idea that this is a vampire that can live among humans. Um, that was something that, that's happened in a lot of books. Fledgling by Octavia Butler, she did that. Uh, if you've read Fever Dream by George R. R. Martin, a, a book that I happen to enjoy, that book was about a steamboat captain on the Mississippi. His name was Abner Marsh. He gets this, this gentleman who's paying him for his steamboat service, Joshua York. He turns out to be a vampire. At first, you don't know if he's a vampire or a vampire hunter, but he ends up being this vampire that is kind of trying to live among the humans. And he does have some, some other vampires that he's fighting against. That kind of trope is, is a little bit done for me. So I want this to be a true return to vampires that are out to either feast on blood or be violent in some way. So the first book that I'm coming at with you today is Certain Dark Things by Sylvia Moreno Garcia. This book came out in 2016. It's since been re-released in different editions. One of the twists on this book is that this is about Mexican and Aztec vampires. The world building in this book is fantastic. In fact, she could easily write two or three or four more books in this world. She's got this full, complete world with different kinds of vampires. Um, the Adel, who is, she's the, the main character. She comes from an Aztec breed of vampires. She's got some characteristics that lean towards, I wouldn't say shape-shifting in particular, but she does have some types of wings and, and feathers. Um, she's not a bat. She doesn't turn into a, a wolf or anything like that. But her race it are, comes from a warrior priestess race that used to, to protect the gods. And they need to, to feed. And she's in a family that is in direct odds in this mafia kind of way, a, a gang type way with uh, the, the necros and the necros are stronger they feed they have more dangerous type teeth and the main villain vampire here is nick godoy and he is searching to destroy everyone who is in adel's family and it moves from there she flees to mexico city from northern mexico and the violence bleeds into the streets of Mexico. Adel, she finds a young human friend that she enlists to help her, and the violence ensues. It's a very readable book. The prose is, is easy to get through, and it feels comfortable. And you think, hmm. How do these creatures really use their human 
friends. They've got what they call Ren Fields, obviously. That's a, a callback to, to Dracula and how vampires have used humans to get what they want. It's an interesting take. I recommend it. It was a fun book for me. This next book that I have won't be a surprise to anybody. It comes from Grady Hendrix, who's one of the darlings in the horror world today. His 2020 release, The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires. I'm going to say that 20 times fast. The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires. It's about Patricia. She's this lady. She's not quite a socialite lady in Charleston, South Carolina, but she makes friends with some of the socialites there. There's one buck club that she goes to and attends, and it turns out to be kind of a fiasco, and some of the other ladies there invite her to come to their book club and to start a new book club, and they read all these true crime books. They become... They become fascinated with true crime, and as they're going through week to week with their book club and their, their socialite status in, in Charleston, a stranger comes to town, and he happens to be a vampire, and he makes these kind of circular travels throughout uh, the, the, the East Coast, and he he's there every... 30, 40 years, and he returns, and nobody knows him, and he's got his own set of, of ways for being able, able to infiltrate society and get what he needs. The book is very violent. If you, it does have a CW for, for violence against women. Um, however, it's a very engaging book. I think it happens to be I liked this one better than his most recent one, which was the Final Girls Support Group, but it doesn't have the same kind of charm as some of his other books, like uh, My Best Friend's My Best Friend's Exorcism. But we're not here to talk about Grady Hendrix's other books. Where does it stand as a horror novel? This one should be right up there for something that you read, especially as the spooky season is coming on. Now the next books on my list, I've got three of them. They're full length novels. It's the Motherless Child Trilogy from Glenn Hirschberg. Now Glenn Hirschberg happens, happens to be one of my favorite writers working at the moment. I think he happens to be better at short stories and I happen to think that he's one of the greatest contemporary authors of the ghost story. He wrote the Motherless Child series one of the things that happened is an editor asked him to write a short story about vampires and he got kind of snobby about it. He was like, I, I don't do vampires because of all the reasons I said before. The genre was oversaturated. There was too much paranormal romance. He's like, I don't do that. And then as he continued to think about the opportunity to write a story, he wrote a short story. It's called Like Lick'em Sticks Like Tina Fey. And that short story became the basis for the novel Motherless Child. Now, what's Motherless Child about? Motherless Child is about Natalie and Sophie. They're a couple of single mothers living in a trailer park. They live close to each other. They rarely get a night out. So one night, they leave the kids with Natalie's mom, Jess. They go to watch live music at a local bar. One of their favorite musicians, he's known as The Whistler, and he kind of keeps tabs not only on where he's going to promote his music, but on where he's going to find his prey through Twitter. He has a Twitter, Twitter following. And after a night at the bar, they wake up. There's dried blood all over the place. And they understand kind of what's happened. They can start to feel the change happening. They're not quite vampires yet. And as they realize that they're becoming vampires, they decide that they can't leave their children exposed to what they're becoming. So they race home and they give Jess, who's Natalie's mom, 
their kids and they go out on a Thelma and Louise style drive across the country to try and escape not only what they're becoming, but the Whistler. Because I feel that Glenn Hirschberg is quite a bit better as a short story author rather than a novelist, some of these books aren't perfect, but he does a lot of things really well. There's a lot of great dialogue. Glenn Hirschberg's great at setting. Uh, he's great, great at setting a tone, a mood. And one of the things that you find here is that motherless, motherless Child, the first book in the series, really tends to be about what it is to be family. As the, the series progresses and you get into Good Girls, you see that the, the ramifications of what happens in the first one, and without any spoilers, we'll say that We'll just say that Jess is, is picking up her family's life and trying to take her family to a new place. They move from North Carolina to New England where they meet Rebecca. Rebecca is having some of her own real life struggles and the real life struggles is something that Glenn Hirschberg really portrays really well. And Jess, who really has now, not with the remnants of her family, really explore the idea that is really explored of found family in Good Girls. She's moving on and we see that, that the Whistler also has family and his family are these other sets of monsters. One of the things that Glenn Hirschberg does throughout the series is that he just expects you, he never creates or world builds in the way that many fantasy or horror writers do. He just expects you to pick up on what a vampire is or he never says that they're vampires, but you gather from what they're doing that they're vampires. And so you see how these people are acting and you get some real kinds of alien thoughts from not only the Whistler, but the Whistler's family who tends, who's the mother, and also Aunt Sally, you'll see the mother and Aunt, Aunt Sally come into play as the stories continue. <clears throat> the third book in the series is Nothing to Devour, and we get this motion from what will people do to save their family in the first one to good girls, which kind of becomes this idea of found family. Who is our family? Sometimes when we don't have family around, who are the people that are going to support us? And then we get to nothing to devour, which is really about, <clears throat> in the end, it's really a continuation of that, those same ideas, but you get a dramatic conclusion because the monsters in the story whose motivations at times uh, we see are either kind of alien or sometimes a little bit flimsy. The story just moves on into even deeper violence. This time again, you still have Jess and her family, but again, we move into Amelia and Amelia's a librarian and Amelia is now kind of the object of obsession. That's one thing that you do see throughout these books is that the Whistler and the mother and Aunt Sally kind of, as with other vampire tales, certain women do become the obsessions of the vampires and that's what leads to the violence in the stories. I happen to love all of these stories. They're great, they're fast paced, they're shorter stories. They read very quickly. You can get through through all of these rather rather quickly. They're fun, and at the same time, they're a little bit more literary than some other vampire tales. Now, my last two books, I've mentioned this in my in one of my bookshelf tours. I, I mentioned the Glenn Hirschberg books then too, but the last two books that I have for you today are two books. They're in a connected world. I wouldn't call, I would not call one a sequel. I would not call one a prequel. They're standalone novels. Um, some of the characters do show up in both of them. And those are Christopher Buhlman's books. The first one that came out that he released was The Lesser Dead. Now The Lesser Dead's about Joey Peacock and it talks, it tells the story for, from the early 1900s and he's got this, he's in this family they're a little bit more well-to-do than other families, and his maid, Margaret, turns him into a vampire. Now, he gets turned into the vampire, 
and he tells his story about his life as a vampire, which moves on into the real crux of where the tension comes. As time progresses, he becomes a vampire. He, he's in New York City and he roams the subways late at night in order to make the kills. Margaret has a whole clan of vampires. She keeps tabs on all of them. She keeps them in order and she rules with a tight fist and she does this in order to make sure that they don't bring the heat down from vampire hunters and whatnot as they're killing in the subways. Then as they're roaming the subways, you get these creepy vampire kids. Now, anybody who's liked The Omen and Children of the Corn know how creepy that kids can be in horror books. And so you've got the undead vampire kids roaming around the subways. And of course, because they're creepy vampire kids, they're stronger, they're more menacing, they're more bloodthirsty, and they can take out the regular vampires quick as all that. So what, what will happen? This is a book that although these vampires are, are nasty, blood-sucking, bloodthirsty creatures, Christopher Buhlman kind of makes you root for the vampires in this versus, versus the creepy vampire kids, which, which is, is a feat. It's a fun book and you'll just have to see what happens. This one happens to have some twists and turns in it that I think shocked a lot of people and they love, they love the climax of the book. The second book comes out, it actually takes place a little bit, well, it kind of takes place in between the beginning of The Lesser Dead and the end because the end of Lesser Dead was in the 70s in New York City in the subways. But the next book is The Suicide Motor Club, and it takes place in the 60s. And it's about a lady, her name's Judith Lamb. Judith and her husband and her boy are on the road, and you get these vampires who, and what they do is they drive the highways on their muscle cars, and what they'll do is they'll use those muscle cars and they'll force people off the road. And as the cars crash and the people are hurt and wounded, that's when they'll feed on the humans. So because it's the 60s and there's not the seatbelt laws and people's kids' arms are out the window and whatnot, they're driving at night and the window's open and the Judas kid has his arm out the window and the vampires snatch the child out of the car, wreck the car. And then what do they do? they make a mistake because they leave Judith alive. Obviously her husband dies, the child is dead, but Judith knows what she saw. She knows what the vampires are and she hooks up with a secret society called the Bereaved. And the Bereaved is a secret society who know about vampires and they're willing to go out and fight and kill the vampires at any cost. I loved this one. I liked this one better than The Lesser Dead. It seems to me with these two books that fans are either bigger on The Lesser Dead or they're bigger on Suicide Motor Club. It seems to me that for most people, it's whichever one they read first or whichever one, whichever trope they liked better. Kind of the vampire hunters in the secret society or the creepy undead children roaming those, those two things, either which one they read first or those or the factors on which one they like most tend to, to get them to like one or the other better. I happen to like The Suicide Motor Club better. It's a fantastic book. I thought the prose was better. I thought the storytelling was better. I thought it was faster paced than The Lesser Dead. And I thought that the characters, I, I connected with the characters a little bit more. And I think that in some ways, despite 
a, a trope, not a trope, but a, a writing technique that a lot of horror writers do. Glenn Hirschberg does this in the Motherless Child trilogy, but you get so many points of view. In fact, certain dark things happen this way too. You get so many points of view that sometimes you don't feel the characters are as built up as much as you would like and the motivations may be somewhat lacking. But in the end, the Suicide Motor Club was... It, I, I can say this. It was the book that brought me back into vampires. I was a little bit tired of vampires like everybody else. I probably wouldn't have read... I probably wouldn't have read Grady Hendrix or Sylvia Moreno Garcia or even the Glenn Hirschberg books, even though I loved Glenn Hirschberg. I probably wouldn't have read those things if I hadn't uh, first. I read The Suicide Motor, Motor Club and I was like, wow, I forgot that people could actually do a great vampire novel. And here they are. They're still here. And that's what got me back into them. And so for spooky season... Those are some vampire books that'll bring the bite back into vampires. I also mentioned quite a few at the beginning, and those books are great vampire books as well. They just didn't happen to be the ones where I'm getting into what's happening kind of here and now. I also wanted to mention some of these ones because they're a little bit lesser known, but they're great books. Give them a try. You won't be disappointed. Tell me which books that you like. If there was something I haven't mentioned, put it in the comments. Maybe I should. Maybe I have read it or maybe I didn't mention it and we need to, to talk about it. So let's talk about it. 